Today's video is sponsored by Forever Pick. Each guitar pick is handmade by Luthier Robert S. Paul in Chicago, Illinois. Enjoy a rainbow of tone when you take advantage of 25% off by clicking the link in today's show notes. Hey y'all, it's Shed Post Friday. Hey, how's it going dudes and dudettes? Brad the Guitar just here. Weeks just keep flying by and it's time again for Shit Post Friday. First up in Shit Post Friday, I wanted to talk about the new Bruce Springsteen on Broadway show that's uh, you can see on Netflix. It's a Netflix original thing that they've produced. I gotta say, I was never really much of a Bruce Springsteen fan growing up. You know, I did not own the album Nebraska. I've never even heard that album, I don't think, although it's pretty critically lauded as being a great album. Um, you know, some of his early albums, too, I just never got into them. I never had any aunts and uncles that owned them. My mom never owned them. So I never really got a chance to listen to and get into Bruce Springsteen, you know, as an artist. You know, I heard of all the stuff that came on the radio, stuff like Glory Days and the like. Uh, and, you know, I have fond memories of that stuff because it reminds me of being a kid, you know, in the backseat of my mom's car when we were driving to the store or something, that song would come on or other songs of his would come on. And I would just get this sense of like, okay, you know, I get it. You know, this is like, this guy's kind of Americana. He's kind of talking about roots. He's talking about blue collar people, you know, and stuff like that. You know, I, I could get a sense that he was talking about my kind of people, sort of, you know, or whatever. But, um, uh, but man, I'm going to tell you something. After watching, uh, I've only watched probably the first 45 minutes or so of this special so far, so I don't have a complete picture yet. But th this is one of the best things that I've seen from a musical artist in a very long time. He'll tell stories about himself growing up, but he does it in a very um, almost iambic pentameter kind of poetic cadence, you know, that's punctuated with these songs. And it's not pretentious. It's not something that makes you feel like, oh, I'm listening to some artsy fartsy bullshit. You know, this guy, he's just an aging rock star who's irrelevant or something like that. No, none of that. I never once thought that. As a matter of fact, it, it reminded me so much of, uh, the comeback of Johnny Cash when he came back later in his career, you know, and he did, he um, covered Hurt and did that amazing video and uh, just powerful stuff he was doing toward the end of his career that just dragged you in and and the, the frailty of his voice had started to become apparent, but there was still strength in it like an old oak tree, you know. That's what this Springsteen special reminds me of, you know, he's like a 68 year old man now and he's uh, reflecting on his life and he's talking about the things that were important to him and the things that drove him in certain directions and made him do certain things take certain career choices you know move to certain cities um, travel you know all the things that you think about when you're young and he's putting them in the context of his music as well you know punctuating these stories uh, deep stories for him obviously uh, with, with songs you know there's one in particular where he, where he goes into his dad and it's just heartbreaking stuff and he's talking about He's talking about his dad and going to the house where his dad used to live and stuff, and um, you know the person telling him nobody by you know nobody by that name lives here anymore, you know, and and he's he just launches into these songs, and that one in particular just was a real tearjerker for me, you know, having a bit of a strained relationship at times with my dad, you know, I love my dad to pieces, and he loves me, and I know that, but I could really relate to what he was saying in that, and I could really relate to him expressing his art through, uh, quote, his dad's voice. You know, he, he said, you know, I never worked a real job a day in my life. You know, I've always had an, ar an artist's job, you know. Um, I've always been able to do this. I've been blessed to do this. And, you know, so it's kind of a lie in a way. You know, all the stuff I talk about with blue-collar workers and everything, he's like, but, you know, I'm, I'm doing it projecting, uh, you know, my dad in a lot of this stuff. You know, he's he's talking about his dad. He's, he's um, putting himself in his dad's shoes and you know he does other songs about his sisters and his mom and it's just a really really personal thing and you can tell this is this is the capstone of of a great career and it really made me want to go back and explore uh this great american artist a little further because i was just blown away i really by the first 45 minutes or so of this special that i've watched so far i had to go to bed because it was like getting really late I guess it was last night I was watching it, but um, I'm going to watch the rest of it, I think, when I get done with Shit Post Friday. But man, this was, it was so good, so moving. There were 
several times it just brought me literally to tears. Uh, wept like a freaking widow. So uh, be prepared. Have some Kleenex boxes close by. <laughs> you might need them if you're anything like me, man. If you're a big softy on the inside, you're uh, you're probably you might uh, have to wipe away a couple. Oh yeah. Also, in other news, like if you guys haven't noticed by now, I've completely changed. This happens once, maybe every I don't know uh, six months or so. Uh, I'll go into a barber shop and I'll have my hair all scruffy and long and it's turned into a mullet in the back and I'll go up to some barber who looks like a you know deer in the headlights and she's like she's like uh, what were you wanting done and I'll explain to her you know I'll just cut it you know cut it short give me a man haircut you know short haircut whatever layered haircut close on the sides well how close do you want it well how oh, uh you know and just really scared to take off more than than i will want or something i'm like no go ahead and shave it you know get it down close because i only get a haircut like once every six months <laughs> i'm a cheap bastard like that and a part of me thinks you know <laughs> they must be thinking i hope this i hope this doesn't catch on as a movement you know you're just going to destroy my business but I look over to the kid in the chair next to me, and I look I look over at him, and his dad's brought him in. Obviously, his dad's like really well groomed, and both him him and his kid, you know, while waiting for their haircuts, they were both on their their phones, you know, and not talking to anybody, and just kind of in their own little worlds. And I'm sitting there with my daughter, and I'm trying to talk to people, you know, and engage people. And it was really nice because a couple people would engage back, and we got this rollicking kind of rolling conversation going before anybody got their haircut. So that was nice. You know, it's always good in a situation like that. Start conversations. Don't just sit there on your fucking phones, people, you know? The world's just gone to pot. There's nothing on the internet that that's, that's that interesting where you have to cut out people that are sitting right next to you, even if you don't know them. You know, get to know them. In the few minutes that, you know, I sat and waited for my haircut, I got to know this guy next to me. He was from Michigan or something, and he... Uh, had moved down here several years ago, yada yada, and was a, as a pilot, you know, and we started talking about airplanes, and this other lady, you know, we, we were talking about uh, whether Christmas shopping was done, you know, just stupid stuff like that at first, and then you, but you get into more stuff, you know, I got into, oh, you know, what middle school does your kid go to, do they like it, you know, and this is how you get start relationships with people, people, this is how it's supposed to happen, <laughs> take notes, millennials. <laughs> But anyway, yeah, this kid next to me was getting his hair cut, and I look over, and his hair, I said, I told the barber, I said, if you can make my hair at the end look like his does at the beginning of his haircut, I'll be happy. Because <laughs> that kid must have gotten his hair cut like, like two weeks ago or something by the look of it, because his hair was flawless. I was like, I was wondering to myself, what are you actually getting a haircut for, you know? There's nothing there. <laughs> so, uh, just... Different strokes for different folks, I guess, man. <laughs> but anyway, I got home and I shaved off my beard and I just cleaned myself up, man, and walked upstairs and and my uh, my little girl looked up at me and she goes, she goes, D -d -d she goes, she wanted to say daddy, uh, but she was she kind of stopped herself and was like, oh hello daddy. She like she saw my eyes, you know, and recognized me. She said, oh hello daddy. That was real funny. It reminded me uh, when I was growing up and my dad would come out of the uh, bathroom, you know, after having shaved his beard or something and sh or shaved off his mustache especially because my dad wore a mustache a lot, you know, especially in the 70s, late 70s, early 80s kind of, you know, he was al always had a mustache and he would, you know, every now and then though, he would shave it off and when he did, it was like, whoa, you know, you're not even the same person, you know, you're not like even a dad anymore. You're like, whoa. So, it just reminded me of that and gave me a little bit of a smile. But anyway, yeah, on to the news. There's lots of stuff actually in the news. It's weird. Every week there seems like there's more and more guitar news and it's hard to get to it all. But this I saw, this is uh, out of the Indianapolis Star and... Uh there's this group of women who are putting on this uh, women's only music festival and the headline just just kind of caught my attention here and and you can kind of see why white guy guitar fest question mark nope this new indie music festival spotlights women okay and all the pictures in the article are not just of women they're of uh, you know women of color i guess you would call them and that doesn't bother me. I don't care about that. It's just it's just strange that every there are, let's see. Let's count them. One, two, three, four photographs in this entire article, and all of them are women of color, which again is okay. I don't care. But then if you scroll down and you actually read the article, it says, you know, there are three girls who established this venture. Uh, it's called Woo Girls, and they're three founders. And uh, let's see, a singer and bass player with Wife Patrol. She chairs the 
Diversity and Inclusion Committee for Girls Rock in Indianapolis. Diversity and Inclusion Committee. What, do you really need a committee for diversity and inclusion for a girls rock and roll thing? But then what's weird is, you know, there's not a single white person in any of these photographs on this for, for this festival, which I, again, I don't I don't care, but it just seems unnecessarily um, combative toward white people or something. It's like with the with the headline, which they can't control the headline. Granted, you know, they didn't write this headline. Obviously, the people at the Indie Star wrote the headline to sell to sell clicks, you know, white guy guitar fest. Nope. You know, and, and here's the thing. It's like, you know, your diversity and inclusion uh, card is talent, folks. You know, if you have talent, there's nothing, nothing is going to stop you. You know, ask Ella Fitzgerald, you know, nothing really st stopped her from becoming a massive star. She became a massive star because she had massive amounts of talent, you know, Billie Holiday had massive amounts of talent. Whitney Houston, massive amounts of talent. She could sing her ass off. Undegi Ocello lady who plays bass, you know, she's a black woman and massive amounts of talent. Kick-ass bass player. Nothing's going to stop her from getting any gig she wants in the probably in the world because she's a badass on the bass guitar, which is in high demand. So it's not has nothing to do with this. You don't need a diversity and, and inclusion. Are, are we not adults anymore, you know? Do we really? And this go, kind of goes back to what I was talking about the barber shop. You know, it's like start conversations, people. Get off your fucking phones. The world doesn't exist in headlines. You know, none of this stuff is real. This is just people clickbaiting you. This is people trying to get you to feel a certain way about society that isn't real. This is this is their own projection of how they think you're going to respond to an article and click on it. You know. So they're trying to write the most salacious thing they possibly can. And this and you know, none of this shit sells. If if there's no racial division, then fucking uh Jesse Jackson's out of a fucking job, you know? Al Sharpton's out of a fucking job. That fucking Muslim lady who go Sarsor or whatever her name is, who goes around fucking starting shit is out of a job, you know? If there's none of this racial division, none of this crazy shit. You know, all these stupid people are out of a fucking job all of a sudden. They, they have no interest in seeing people come together. They have no interest in seeing people question this shit, you know? Which is why, when you know, it should be more than just white guys like me questioning this kind of shit, you know? People need to stand up and say something about it and be unafraid to say something about it because it's fucking important. It's important that the world doesn't turn into this any further than it already has. It seemed to me that, you know, when I was growing up in the 90s, like late 90s, uh, when I, by the time I'd gotten out of school, yes, there were racial divisions in my school. Yes, there were certain times because you know I grew up kind of on the edge of the South, and we we had deep-seated problems, and there were uh, divisions among uh, people drawn on all kinds of lines, racial lines, class lines, whatever you name it. And there were some divisions, but. The thing is, you know, by the late 90s, by the time I got out of school, I just chalked it up to, oh, man, that's just high school bullshit. You know, all those stupid little divisions and people acting in gangs and shit. Because you would see somebody who in school you never talked to outside of school, you know, in the late 90s or early 2000s, and you'd get along with them uh, without fail. You know, it's like everybody grew up, you know. And then it seemed like the millennials started growing up also. And then they just started bringing in all this division with them or something like or they didn't bring it in. It's like the controllers started started uh, marketing it to them like, oh, you're you know, you're all victims in one way or another. You just don't know it yet, you know, and teaching them to be victims and teaching all this division is just fucking crazy. They're just downloading bullshit into people's heads. And I'm fucking frankly sick of it. You know, it seemed like the, the racial division, the sexism and all that stuff, it just you know, and obviously somebody's going to say, oh, well, you're just a white guy. You don't see it. You don't get it. You know, well, no, I mean, you know, I, I grew up low class. I, I grew up in a, you know, really low class. I lived in a trailer park when I was a kid, you know, for a, for a long time there. You know, I, I, I didn't grow up eating caviar. Let's put it that way. So, yeah, I think I know a little bit about what I'm talking about. We, I had to grow up getting along with a lot of different people. I had to grow up getting along with a lot of people who I didn't agree with, you know, and we would have to find some kind of common ground. It just doesn't seem like people are willing to find that common ground anymore. We have to have things like, you know, women-only festivals. And not only that, but we have to have diversity, diversity and inclusion, inclusion committees, committee. you know, for these festivals or for these foundations or whatever. Within, within this, there's actually segregation within the segregation. It's just let, let girls be girls, man. Let boys be boys. 
and let them come together at some point and have a fucking music festival that doesn't have to have anything to do with women this or men that. You know, if you had a men's fest, men's only festival, it would be, I would, I would boycott it. You know, why would you have a men's only festival? I wouldn't want to go to that. It's like, why would you deliberately exclude women? It's like, I don't get it. And why would a women's festival deliberately exclude men artists? You know, I just don't get it. It's like, make music, be happy, stop the bullshit. You guys know how I feel about uh, thieves, so I thought this was kind of interesting. You know, every year the, uh, the major carriers, UPS, FedEx, you know, they all kind of beef up their staff for the holidays because they have so much overload. Um, and this was interesting to me because this UPS seasonal package employee helped to steal a guitar from a front porch, allegedly. I guess they realized they had this expensive guitar on their on their truck. It probably said, you know, Gibson on the outside or PRS or whatever. Yeah, so there's not actually not much in this article. It doesn't say a whole lot. It just does say that uh, the homeowner had a camera system and it caught... Uh, it caught these two people sort of being suspicious and uh, one of them I guess walked away with the package and the other one was suspicious enough I guess to be um, to be arrested also but you know it's just interesting that that this stuff happens and and you know I always look out for my neighbors and stuff even like if I come home and I know that they're not going to be home for several hours and they have a package on their porch you know a lot of times I'll grab it and either bring it in my house for them or I'll move it to their back door or something you know just so it doesn't tempt thieves that might be you know roaming around you know we should all try to look out for each other in this way you know I know it's very hard with the way that society is now nobody even talks to one another they might live next door to one another for fucking years and never even talk to one another I get the sense that that probably was the case before I moved into this house. I'm a very outgoing kind of person. So when I'm outside and I see some one of my neighbors outside, I say hello, you know, and I talk to them and stuff and get to know them a little bit, you know, just so, because it's beneficial for everybody. You got to get to know your neighbors. You got to, you know, if you don't know them, how are you going to love your neighbor? You know what I mean? So that's kind of part of it. But you talk to your neighbors, you build some rapport with them and you have mutually beneficial things like this, you know, if they, and if I would hope that if they saw a package on my front porch, they would move it for me too, you know, move it to the back door or something for me so that, that it doesn't uh, get stolen. Or if it's raining or something, you know, a couple times it was raining on their packages as so I move those under something or whatever, you know, you got to look out for one another people don't steal from one another. This is the, this is the season to give, not to steal, you know, be, let's be better than that. And for the two people, you know, who colluded to steal this guy's high-end guitar, uh, chop their fucking hands off. Another bit of news I thought was supremely interesting was this. This digital music news article claims that Gibson may suffer a serious setback in its bid to exit bankruptcy. Now, I've been talking about Gibson exiting bankruptcy as far back as, I guess, October, whenever it first was announced that they were coming out of bankruptcy. Uh, actually, I think it was kind of reported widely that they had emerged from bankruptcy. So that was kind of the reporting that I was reading, and that's what I passed along, that they had emerged from bankruptcy. Well, apparently not. Apparently, they had some outstanding unresolved claim objections uh, and fee applications from some of their debtors. I don't know if this is a case of, like, the judge just tried to hurry things along and jump the gun and just ignored these people or what the deal was. But I do know that KKR, they're, uh, the people who are uh, primarily taking over Gibson, those are their primary uh, debtors. They have a lot of money and a lot of clout. I'm sure that that might have had something to do with it. But the interesting thing is, you know, it just seemed like they tried to rush things along. And right now, uh, the U.S. Trustee's Office, which is kind of like, I guess, like an appeals process, part of an appeals process, some of the debtors have appealed to them to delay the attempt to exit Chapter 11. So that's very interesting, and we'll have to see what develops out of that. Could this mean that Gibson's plan, you know, to emerge and to become fruitful again are going to be hampered as a result of this? We'll have to wait and see. Uh, it's certainly a possibility by the sound of this. I don't think I don't think there's really a chance that Gibson is not going to be some sort of entity going forward. I, I, I don't think it's about that. I think it's just a, a, about how much they're going to be able to do and how fast they're going to be able to try to recover the business and rebuild everything and, and try to you know, get back to productivity because, you know, as I reported last week, I think it was that they, you know, they're completely closing down the Memphis operations and moving those to Nashville. They said they're moving them to Nashville. Of course, they haven't set up in Nashville yet. So maybe they're just dropping that business, that part of the, you know, guitar business for a little while. Maybe they'll wait for a couple of years before they 
you know, reissue 335s again or hollow bodies or whatever. I don't know. It's very interesting. Okay, this is one of the most interesting things that I've seen in quite a while. Uh, a while back, I reported on... Uh, some people who had lost, you know, limbs and they were trying to regain the ability to play instruments and do just basic tasks and all this stuff. And it just got us off into this big, long kind of um, train of thought on cyborgs and like, you know, are humans even going to need to be have a body before too long? You know, maybe they can transplant our brain and somebody else and like just have, you know, I don't know. But anyway, it was really interesting and uh, was was a popular and funny video, I thought. But this to me is, is just as interesting as all that. This guy had a brain tumor, okay? His name is Musa Manzini, okay? He's not some sort of Italian illusionist. He's a South African jazz multi-instrumentalist. Jazz, uh, yeah. <laughs> Can't, sorry, I can barely say that. So anyway, Mr. Uh, Manzini had developed this brain tumor and uh, they had to perform this six hour operation. Part, try to preserve and restore some of his finger movements because he was losing finger movements. And this is, you know, anybody who plays guitar knows if you start losing finger movements, you got massive issues. And this is probably not only gonna be a physical problem, but this is gonna play a really heavy psychological toll. You know, it, it's interesting that during this six hour surgery, they kept him awake. They did not put him under a general anesthetic and knock him out. They kept him awake and he played guitar the whole time. And what they were actually doing was tweaking around in his brain and he could give feedback as to, oh yeah, the, well this is easier now, you know? Just very interesting. Uh, there's a video of this whole procedure. It shows him gently plucking the instrument on top of the operating table as the medical staff tends to him. Just really fascinating stuff. You know, I think if I had another life to live over, if I had it to do, kind of do over, being a, being a brain surgeon would just be tops. You're helping someone in the ultimate way you can help someone. You're restoring someone's uh, identity. You're restoring someone's physical self. You know, not only that, but nurses too. God bless nurses. Everybody who works in that kind of field, uh, you know, Merry Christmas to all you guys and God bless you all. This is just, to me, it's just an amazing thing and um, I salute you. All right, guys, so that's going to do it for Ship Post Friday here on Channel One, uh, but subscribe over to Channel Two if you have not already. Uh, I usually, every weekend, I try to put some bonus material from Ship Post Friday over on Channel Two. I haven't done it for the last couple weeks, but usually I, I've been doing that. And uh, this week I've got, I just shot a lot of material, so I've got enough probably for a whole nother Ship Post Friday over on Channel 2, so definitely be sure to subscribe over there. Uh, I will put a link down in the description for that. For now though, we will see y'all later.